shackled in court. The teen suspect charged in the racially motivated mass shooting in Buffalo pleads not guilty. He's accused of gunning down 10 people, all of them black, and wounding three others. Some families of the victims calling him a coward in the courtroom. Tonight, a look at investigators' deep dive into the 18-year-old social media trail. Relief for millions of panicked parents. The CDC recommending Pfizer booster shots for children ages 5 to 11. Pfizer insists the booster is safe and increases antibodies against Omicron. Who's to blame for the deepening baby formula crisis? Today, the head of the FDA in the hot seat on Capitol Hill criticized for decisions that led the nation into the shortage. What he had to say about the agency's potential missteps and why frantic families could see more supplies soon. The most restrictive abortion ban in America, passed by the Oklahoma legislature. Now, it's on its way to the governor, who is expected to sign it. The bill outlaws most abortions after fertilization. Rachel Scott joins us with what happens next. Our world in the midst of unrest. Vladimir Putin nodding to the possibility of using nuclear weapons. North Korea testing missiles. How has America prepared? Our Martha Raddatz takes us on a classified mission inside a U.S. nuclear submarine. It's an ABC News exclusive. I'd say it's the most powerful force in the world right now. From songwriter to singing superstar, I sit down with Money Long, who is in her moment, thanks to her sultry sound and her social media takeover. Turn up your speakers for our latest Prime playlist. Any limits, like there's literally no limitations. I'm always like, why not? Good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us tonight. We begin with the aftermath of that deadly supermarket shooting in Buffalo that left 10 people dead. Late today, the mayor announcing, along with investigators, the evidence collection phase of that investigation is over and tops is committed to reopening as soon as possible. The neighborhood supermarket is critical for the East Buffalo community, which up until it opened was a food desert. In the meantime, Tops is offering free shuttle buses to other stores and food distribution sites nearby. The suspected shooter appeared in court today. He is facing one count of murder and will be held without bail while a grand jury weighs additional charges. A family member of one of the victims shouting, calling him a coward. And we are getting new details tonight about how the, sus the suspect allegedly misled law enforcement and mental health officials in order to amass an arsenal. Stephanie Ramos leads us off again tonight from Buffalo. Tonight, the 18-year-old accused of shooting 13 people in a racially motivated attack at that Buffalo supermarket appearing in court under tight security. For the first time, Peyton Gendron facing some of the families of the 10 killed and three injured five days ago. We understand what today's proceeding is about. Yes. And as he was led out of the courtroom, a victim's relative yelling out. Hey, you're a coward. The suspect, who pleaded not guilty to an initial charge of first-degree murder, now indicted by a grand jury. With 11 out of the 13 shooting victims black, authorities are investigating Saturday's rampage at the Topps store as a hate crime and racially motivated violent extremism. How dare you! Victims' relatives sharing their anguish today, among them the mother of Hayward Patterson's son, Jake. His heart is broken. He has sleep, he has eat, and as a mother, what am I supposed to do? Investigators are combing through the suspect's social media posts, where authorities say he documented his months-long plot to kill as many black people as possible. The suspect able to collect weapons even after he was investigated by state police nearly a year ago for disturbing comments about murder-suicide around his high school graduation. Neither the school or police filing a petition in a court, which could have triggered a red flag for any gun purchases in the future. Tonight, the FBI concluding its investigation at the supermarket, releasing it to tops as the company vowed to reopen. And it will be an honor to, uh, to the victims and all the survivors of this uh, tragic event. Employee Jerome Bridges says he'll return, telling our affiliate WKBW he led colleagues to safety in a back room when the gunfire erupted. Since that day, he has not taken off his top's name tag. It helps remind me that anything is possible, anything can happen at any time, any place, any day of the week. Stephanie Ramos joins us now from Buffalo. Stephanie, we've been reporting all week here on Prime just how important the Topps supermarket is to that community. And Topps does plan to reopen, but it sounds like it might take a little more time. 
It, it, it seems as though it will. There is no timeline as to when they'll reopen. Top says they have some repairing and some rebuilding to do, but they do say that when they do reopen, they'll do so in a respectful manner and also in a way where they can honor the victims. Phil. Stephanie Ramos from Buffalo tonight. Thank you. Next to the FDA commissioner on the hot seat on Capitol Hill today over the baby formula crisis, facing tough questions about why it took his agency so long to intervene. He did say the Abbott factory, which has been closed since February, could be up and running again by next week. Parents tonight, though, still worried it will take much longer than that to restock shelves. Maria Villarreal reports. Tonight in Washington, lawmakers grilling the head of the FDA, demanding to know how the baby formula crisis was allowed to happen. You can't hide behind an investigation. We need answers. We need them now. You know, uh, as I've said, we could do better than we did. Dr. Robert Califf promising the situation will get gradually better with the reopening of Abbott's main formula manufacturing plant in Michigan. We've already made significant progress. And I think we are on track to get open within uh, the next uh, week to two weeks, most likely uh, at the outer bound two weeks. President Biden invoking the Defense Production Act to rush formula ingredients to manufacturers and import formula from overseas. But even with that, the FDA commissioner acknowledging it'll be a few weeks until things get back to normal. Are you sleeping, baby? Cold comfort for parents like Amanda Mendoza, who is struggling to feed her seven-month-old daughter. I went to over 20 stores in one day. Aisle upon aisle of empty shelves. It's like this everywhere we go. The search stressful and demoralizing. Sometimes I want to cry when I don't find it because I don't know if she's going to eat. In that same town, another mom, Jacqueline Medrano, joining a Facebook group trying to help. It's called the Nationwide Formula Search, with nearly 800 members in less than two weeks. Essentially, you could have a mom who hasn't been able to find formula in their area, but maybe someone in another state has what they're needing. You can really hear how desperate these women are becoming, um, trying to figure out what their next move is going to be. How does it make you feel? Um, it makes me feel like I can't do enough. Maria joins us now from Dallas. Maria, we're learning more than a million bottles of formula will soon be on the way to the U.S. from where overseas. That's exactly right, Phil. What we've learned is that this first flight will come from Switzerland as a part of the administration's Operation Fly Formula. We do understand that they will focus on bringing in 246 pallets, a very specialized formula for children that have a cow's milk protein allergy. And as we know, that serves a very critical medical need right now. Phil? Maria Villarreal, thank you. And there is a new warning tonight about scammers using the baby formula shortage to take advantage of desperate parents. The FTC is urging consumers to beware of online scammers charging sky-high prices for formula that never comes. ABC's Ari Reshef has details. The dire shortage of baby formula forcing many moms to scour social media for supply. But now an urgent warning from the Better Business Bureau to look out for thieves taking advantage. They're on a social media platform and a chat box pops up. Someone is claiming to sell that product and they are asking people to pay using a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. And once that money is paid out, they never end up receiving that product. This as seven states raise the alarm about baby formula scams, according to new reporting from ABC News. In Texas, first-time mom Jessie Esparza Wolgamuth says she went to 10 stores before she turned to the online community for help. I sent her $290. I messaged her afterwards and she just didn't respond to me afterwards. She says those coveted cans never showed up. And then I realized I was like, yeah, I just got scammed. Tennessee mom Kate Fazio says she got scammed earlier this year, the seller even sending her a fake tracking number. This woman responded to my post to say that she had had a couple of cans. We exchanged information. Um, nothing was really out of the ordinary. 
until after I paid her. The Better Business Bureau says scammers can appear legitimate, posting ads or commenting on reputable Facebook groups offering to sell formula, even showing photos of the cans they claim are available. But the catch, once payment is made, the source goes dark. Find another way to make a payment using a credit card because you have a better chance of getting your money back if you never receive that order. Our thanks to Ariel for bringing us that warning. Next, to the pandemic tonight, a CDC panel is officially recommending Pfizer booster shots for children 5 to 11. It comes as a study shows that two doses of the vaccine provides little protection from the contagious Omicron B2 variant, but a booster shot should be enough protection. Daily COVID-19 cases have quadrupled since March to 100,000 new cases per day. Here's Whit Johnson. Tonight, a CDC panel signing off on booster shots for kids 5 to 11 years old, five months after their initial shots. 11 yeses, one no, one abstention, and so the motion passes. The CDC pointing to the vaccine's waning protection against symptomatic infections across all age groups, from 60% after two doses to 20% a few months later. But protection remains strong against severe disease. New Pfizer data showed the booster shot increased antibodies 22-fold against Omicron in 5 to 11-year-olds who had no evidence of prior COVID infection. When we look at the efficacy of vaccine, it's not only just about getting the virus, but it's also about protecting our children from becoming hospitalized, long COVID, the various other things that can happen when we get a virus like this. Pharmacies now gearing up to roll out more boosters, some parents eager to get in line. I know a lot of people that are getting sick, so I mean, whatever helps. Others still on the fence. Like this came out with two stuff, too much stuff too fast for me. But the panel today voicing concern that more than 70% of kids in that age group haven't even gotten their first two doses. Boosters are great once we've got everyone their first round, and I think that needs to be a priority. This as the country is now averaging nearly 100,000 new COVID cases every day. Infections quadrupling in the last six weeks. About 25,000 patients in the hospital, the highest number since mid-March. I will say this particular virus continues to throw us curveballs, and I think it really continues to find people who have not been infected. And Whit Johnson joins me now. Whit, these boosters come at a time where we are seeing rising transmission and a third of Americans living in an area that is either medium or high risk. So what should people in those areas be doing now? Phil, for those high-risk areas like right here in New York City, the CDC is again recommending that people wear masks indoors, but many public officials are reluctant to bring back the mandates. At the same time, 39 states and territories are now seeing an increase in hospital admissions. Phil? With Johnson tonight, thank you. Okay, we want to get some more insight on all of this for parents watching right now. And for that, we turn to ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Alok Patel of Stanford Children's Health. Doctor, thanks for taking the time. Bill, thank you. And in addition to being a medical contributor, I'm a parent who knows exactly what people are going through. All right, so let's get right into it. The CDC is now greenlit boosters for children 5 to 11. But as you know, fewer than one third of children in that range have actually taken the first two shots to begin with. Many parents say they hesitated because it's believed kids have a lower risk of severe sickness than adults. That's what we were told. Has that equation changed at all? It, Phil, it hasn't changed that kids are less likely to get severe illness, but we do know that children still can. They still can get hospitalized, pass it on to someone else, develop long COVID, and the odds are actually increasing now that we're getting more spread across all age groups, including over 90,000 kids testing positive last week. And I'm glad you brought up the fact that only 30% in this age group has been vaccinated because as we talk about boosters, we still need to keep that front and center goal in mind. I hope this conversation about boosters and the fact that the CDC's independent review committee gave it the green light gives parents even more confidence not only in the booster but in the first two shots yeah maybe some will go back and get the first two shots and then continue on would be the hope so when those booster doses do become available what's your advice for parents what's the timeline for when they should actually consider getting those extra shots for their kids well as of now parents want to wait five months after getting the second shot and if there's any questions about a previous Omicron infection in your child, what your community transmission looks like, or the specific timing in your own individual case. Questions we're already getting asked. Parents should chat with their healthcare professional because certain situations may change what your doctor recommends. But I think this news is welcome news, Phil, especially to those parents with children who have underlying medical conditions, kids who have immunocompromised conditions as well. So even though I don't think the 
parents are going to rush out in large quantities and get this booster shot, the ones who absolutely need it, the ones who are high risk will, and that's important. Let's talk a little bit more about that. The CDC recently estimated that two out of three children have already had COVID. So do those kids need boosters now? This is sort of another one of those timing issues, or do they have natural antibodies that protect them? And if they do, for how long? There's no doubt that kids who have had infections in the past have na some form of natural immunity. But the reality is it's hard to tell when they had the infection, how long that natural immunity lasts, and if it's actually durable against these new variants. Because what studies have shown is that a previous infection to an earlier strain of Omicron may not be holding up against B2121. This is even the case with vaccine-acquired immunity. We know that after a certain amount of time, that immunity goes down as well. The first few shots in this age group, even though it's still protective, against hospitalizations, it's not as protective against mild or even those moderate symptoms, which we don't want any kids to get sick. We don't want kids passing it on to someone else, missing school or anything like that. We're still waiting on authorization for the first vaccine doses for children under five years old. So do you know anything more about the timeline of that? And is there any concern that we could see even more hesitancy from parents on vaccines for kids in the younger age group? Well, Phil, to address your latter point, I do think that there is going to be some hesitancy from parents among this younger age group. We know that as the age group gets younger, parents are more and more protective as they should be, which is why I think it's so important that we're transparent about the vetting process. People saw the FDA give an approval for this vaccine, the booster shot in eight kids five to 11, but parents forget that the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices with the CDC are experts in this area. And as many of them have said, they wouldn't approve any vaccine unless they would give it to their own children. I hope that's the same dialogue that goes through in June when they discuss vaccines for younger children. Parents will also be wanting to look to see what things look like in the country with cases and with new variants. But I recommend all parents out there ask questions, go to evidence based sources and stay curious. We are all are on the same page when it comes to defending our youngest. And doctor, you follow the numbers closely. We are seeing cases and hospitalizations on the rise yet again. Talk about the return of masking indoors. And I know there is COVID fatigue. How difficult is it going to be to implement after months of no mask mandates, especially when it comes to schools that have ended masking? Is it going to be too hard to get that done if we need to? I don't think we can make any mistake about the fact that it is going to get difficult for people to revert back, which is why there was so much pushback when the CDC changed its metrics a few months ago. People saying, hey, if we have to go backwards now, we're going to run into a problem. And Phil, we're already seeing this right now with people saying that we're done with the restrictions and we don't want to live with it. But that inevitably pushes us into normalizing over 500 deaths a day and hundreds of thousands of positive tests each week in all age groups. It leaves us away from focusing on getting boosters and people above the age of 65 and getting all that layer protection into place. We just have to face reality that we still have a lot of infection out there. And even when we transition into an endemic, we still could have a lot of deaths. Endemic diseases are still deadly. Just look at malaria. We have to face this as we move into fall and we do everything we can to make sure that things stay open, schools stay open, and people are, are able to live with some type of normalcy. Amen to that. Dr. Alok Patel, thank you so much for your expertise as always. Bill, thank you. The Oklahoma State Legislature has passed the most restrictive abortion ban in America. Now, onto the governor's desk, and he is expected to sign it. The bill bans almost all abortions from the moment of conception, and it relies on lawsuits from private citizens to enforce it, similar to that law passed in Texas earlier this year. ABC's Rachel Scott joins us with what happens next. Tonight in Oklahoma, a bill banning almost all abortions from the moment of conception, heading to the governor who has vowed to sign it. We want to outlaw abortion in the state of Oklahoma. The bill includes narrow exceptions to protect the life of the mother and for cases of rape and incest, but only if they're reported to law enforcement. I sat down with the bill's author, State Representative Wendy Stearman. Critics say, why not make exceptions to cover all of those instances, especially when rape and incest are so underreported? Well, the goal of this is to protect the child, the, the unborn child. So I, I believe that putting in the exception as we have it is, um, is acceptable in this situation. But today, Vice President Kamala Harris calling it outrageous. It's just the latest in a series of extreme laws around the country. The Oklahoma bill takes a page out of the Texas playbook, empowering private citizens to sue anyone who aids or abets an abortion. The reward, at least $10,000. And when it is signed, it will take effect immediately. 
And Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, how quickly do you think there will be legal challenges to this bill? Well, Planned Parenthood is already gearing up for a fight. They say that they will use every single tool that they have to challenge this in the courts, but they're already dealing with a setback. Just weeks ago, Oklahoma's governor signed a bill into law that bans abortion as early as six weeks into pregnancy. Planned Parenthood unable to stop that bill from going forward in that state. And so now abortions have all but stopped in the state of Oklahoma, Phil. All right, Rachel Scott, thank you. We turn now overseas where Ukraine has new support as it looks to continue to fend off Russia's invasion. President Biden today side by side with the leaders of Finland and Sweden as he welcomed their applications to join NATO. It comes as the U.S. Senate overwhelmingly approved $40 billion in new military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Here's ABC's senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel. Tonight, that $40 billion aid package for Ukraine passing Congress and going to President Biden to sign. At the White House today, Biden welcoming the leaders of Sweden and Finland and their bid to join the NATO alliance. They have the full, total, complete backing of the United States of America. The president with a message for Russia as well. New members joining NATO is not a threat to any nation. It's not just American money and weapons that are helping Ukraine with the war, but American fighters too. These are some of the soldiers of the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. There are at least 25 Americans in this unit at a secret location outside Kharkiv. Really, we just wanted to help the Ukrainian people. We believe that um, their, their fight is a just fight and we wanted to be here and support them. Many of them are combat veterans who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and are now volunteering to fight Russia on their own dime. Even though the Biden administration has told Americans not to join the fight in Ukraine. Like the U.S. government, this is now a war they say they'll see through to the bitter end. Ian Panel from Ukraine tonight. When we come back, the explosion at a pier, the smoke seen for miles, the injury reports we are learning about tonight. She wrote so many hits for other musicians, but a fateful encounter with a rap superstar helped her decide to sing her own songs. Now, Money Long is topping the charts. It is tonight's prime playlist. But up next, our journey beneath the Pacific with North Korea threatening nuclear missile tests and Putin insinuating he would use the same weapons too. How would America respond? Our Martha Raddatz joined a classified mission to find out. It's an ABC News exclusive, next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and 
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. As President Biden heads to Asia for meetings with our allies in South Korea and Japan, tensions remain high as North Korea threatens nuclear missile tests and Vladimir Putin suggests using nuclear weapons in the war in Ukraine. So tonight, we have an ABC News exclusive with rare access to a U.S. Navy nuclear ballistic missile submarine, part of our efforts to deter potential nuclear threats. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz recently got a rare glimpse into life aboard a nuclear sub and a look at what the U.S. military does on the seas to try to keep us safe. It is a breathtaking sight that few will ever see. A nuclear armed ballistic missile submarine 550 feet long surfacing briefly in the Pacific Ocean. With 20 strategic nuclear missiles on board, this submarine is America's most heavily armed warship. I'd say it's the most powerful force in the world right now. Vice Admiral Bill Houston is the commander of U.S. submarine forces, including this ship, the USS Maine. As we approach the massive submarine, he stresses that the mission of the 150 sailors on board is deterrence. We are trying to prevent war with this ship right now, and we're trying to protect U.S. allied and partner interests with this. With the crisis in Ukraine, the ratcheting up of rhetoric from Russia and China, that goal is now being put to the test. When you hear Vladimir Putin and Lavrov and others talk about the possibility of using nuclear weapons, what does that do when you're on a submarine like this? It's uh, very dangerous. It's really irresponsible. And from a naval officer standpoint, it's very unprofessional. It gives more meaning to this mission. But we view our mission as a peace mission. It's purely defensive. From the unnerving yet necessary launch simulations to remaining constantly vigilant while on board, it is a mission this tight-knit crew does not take lightly. What are we, day 48, 49, something like something that? Something like that, yeah. You lose count, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I really like it, though. Women have only been allowed to serve on submarines since 2010. 22-year-old EMN3 Carla Galindo Gonzalez from Colorado is one of them. Explain why you really like being under sea for that long. So it really takes you away from everything outside. It's easier to keep everything else that's really distracting you from moving forward. ETVC Chief Wendy Shewitt from Nebraska joined the Navy to serve her country and see the world. After spending years working on airplanes, now at sea. Amazingly, there are people who still don't know that women are on submarines. Right. Is that challenging? It is, but we're simple. I think they try to uh, walk on eggshells around and they just don't know how to react to us. But they're here to work their butt off and couldn't be prouder of the females we have aboard right now. It's pretty much a community on it this is. boat, too. It's a bunch isn't of it? brothers. Here, <laughs> brothers so. and sisters yes, now. Finally. The patrols are constant. Those 20 nuclear missiles capable of striking a target from 4,000 miles away. Weapons gone, standing by for fire order. Training exercises are a regular part of everyday life on this ship, including simulating a launch. And now we're headed for the missile control center. That's where the missiles would actually be launched from. It is just down from the control center. There, we saw two junior officers arrive and open a safe, which would contain the key to unfathomable firepower for a simulated exercise. 
Lieutenant junior grade Aaron Chandler was a French and economics major at Tulane University. Direct the simulated launch of six missiles. She is now the assistant operations officer on the submarine. Lock the key in the safe. Lock, Lock the, key the key in the safe, safe. Hi, sir. When you hold that key, even though you're simulating it, do you think how serious a job that is and what could happen? It is pretty crazy, but the gravity of the situation is not ever lost. It is really sobering to think about the implications of what that key actually does. Um, but, I mean, that's why, that's why we're here. That's why we train. But even what passes for a normal day on this submarine is far from it. This is the birthing area where all of the sailors sleep nine to a bunk crew. But in between, these are the tubes where the ballistic missiles are stored. That very small shared sleeping space affords almost zero privacy. But privacy is hard to find on this submarine. Enlisted sailors eat their meals in this cruise mess. And in the galley, CSS3 James Curtis shows us how to pack breakfast, lunch, and dinner for months at sea. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of food. And how do you keep all that food fresh? The oldest products get used first, and um, so we could maintain the freshness of the food. Um, if we get fresh, uh, we usually burn through that uh, pretty fast. There are no phones, no televisions, only occasional use of email. We're catching up on you know, several months' worth of information that we missed, uh, going home talking to our families. We don't, you know, they know everything that's happened while we're gone. The ship's captain, Commander Darren Gerhardt, says while life on board can be difficult, there are silver linings that keep morale high. Today, a game of cards, cribbage. It's tradition. But almost everyone on this submarine volunteered for this kind of work. And with tensions across the world so high, Admiral Houston tells us this submarine's mission is as crucial as ever. Do you feel like we're in another Cold War? I would say it's a Cold War, but it's a Cold War that we haven't really experienced. In the Cold War, it was the United States and the Soviet Union, and now it's China, Russia, and the United States, with China and Russia being near-peer adversaries. And how does that change your job? Makes it um, more challenging, but I can tell you the Navy and the submarine force and this crew is ready for that challenge every single day, 365, 24-7. A challenge that will continue unabated. Martha Raditz joins me now. Martha, just remarkable access, remarkable access to that sub, something many Americans never get to see. We should note, though, that missions like this are so classified, there were actually some ground rules for you when you were there. Uh, absolutely. First of all, no one on the crew would tell us exactly where we were. In fact, many of the crew number members don't know exactly where they are, only the people who have to know. But we also had our video checked by the Navy when we left the submarine. They just wanted to check to make sure none of those images revealed anything classified, Phil. Mm. All right, Martha, thank you so much. And you can see more of Martha's rare access inside the sub and exclusive reporting on America's nuclear defense this Sunday on This Week. And still ahead here tonight on Prime, Amber Heard's sister back on the stand. We have the latest in that contentious trial. And the makeup artist turned social media star who has captivated millions with her deeply personal messages about her battle with Crohn's disease on this World Inflammatory Bowel Disease Day. And our continued look at what's behind the nation's gun violence tonight. We look at the spike in gun manufacturing by the numbers. But first, our post of the day as Twitter buzzes about the reported birth of Rihanna's baby, music star Ed Sheeran had his own announcement today, the arrival of a baby girl. black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. Just days before the mass shooting in Buffalo, the CDC reported that gun homicides surged to the highest level in 26 years in 2020. And preliminary data shows the surge continued in 2021. So what's behind the relentless gun violence tonight? Looking at gun manufacturing by the numbers. U.S. gun manufacturers made 187% more firearms in 2020 than they did just 20 years ago. That's according to an ATF report released this week. And gun imports are up 350% over that same time period. 24,080%. That's how many more short barreled rifles were made. The smaller and easier to use and conceal semi automatics are illegal in some states, but handguns became the most popular firearm in recent years. More than 11 million were produced and sold in the U.S. in 2020 alone. That's about half of all gun production that year. So-called ghost guns made on 3D printers or from parts ordered online are being used in more crimes now. Police recovered 19,344 of the untraceable guns in 2021. That's up from less than 2,000 in 2016. But most guns used in crimes are still built by manufacturers and fall into criminal hands through theft. Nearly 85,000 guns were reported lost or stolen by licensed gun dealers between 2016 and 2020. The Justice Department says that number pales in comparison to the number stolen from individuals in home and car burglaries. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The wildfire danger across 10 states, leaving dozens of homes destroyed. The monkeypox outbreak comes to the U.S. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. at stake in our world right now we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making abc news america's number one news and thank you for making abc news live america's number one streaming news now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. 
Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Wearing an orange jumpsuit, white face mask, and shackles, mass shooting suspect Peyton Gendron appeared before the judge, while relatives of some of the 10 black people he's charged with killing in a Buffalo supermarket heckled him. Hey, you're a coward! Surrounded by heavy security, the 18-year-old suspect, who has pleaded not guilty, remained silent throughout the hearing, which lasted just a few minutes before it was rescheduled for next month. A grand jury indicting Gendron on a first-degree murder charge, but authorities continue to investigate the possibility of adding new charges, including hate crimes and terrorism. The FBI is poring over Gendron's social media posts, which appear to suggest the self-professed white supremacist was radicalized online during the early days of the pandemic. Congressional leaders today vowing to combat hate crimes. We cannot continue to turn a blind eye to white supremacist vigilantes. It impacts all of us. More testimony comes today in the trial over the defamation lawsuit brought by Johnny Depp against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. Due on the stand today, one of Depp's ex-girlfriends, actress Ellen Barkin. People closest to actress Amber Heard testified Wednesday about what they say they witnessed as Heard and ex-husband Johnny Depp continue their defamation battle. Heard's sister Whitney described a violent fight in March 2015, where she alleges Depp not only hit Amber, he hit her too. I hear Amber shout, don't hit my sister. She smacks him, lands one. By that time, Johnny had already grabbed Amber by the hair with one hand and was whacking her repeatedly in the face with the other. Depp has denied ever hitting Heard, but a makeup artist testified she saw evidence of injuries when working with the actress for a December 2015 late night talk show appearance. A day after Heard alleges Depp split her lip open among other injuries she says he caused. Emergency crews on the scene of an explosion and fire at a construction company in Waukesha County, Wisconsin. Two dozen people inside at the time. Authorities say at least six people injured, including three firefighters. Black smoke seen for miles. There were explosive materials, including diesel in the building. About 30 tanker trucks hauling water to the scene because of a lack of fire hydrants. High winds are driving a wildfire through the grass and brush of West Texas. Mandatory evacuations are in effect for multiple communities as the mesquite heat fire continues to burn. The fire is currently 5,000 acres and only 5% contained. Stuart Morris is a public information officer for Texas A&M Forest Service. We're going to be on this for a while, unfortunately, and so... Uh... You know, main thing is just we're going to try and pace ourselves and, and get through this best we can. Health officials say they're investigating one confirmed case of monkeypox in the U.S. Clusters of cases are reported abroad. Right now, we know there are infections in Canada, the U.K., Spain, Portugal, and Massachusetts now. 
Monkeypox is rarely found in the U.S. It's a cousin of chicken pox and smallpox, but less contagious. It is spread through close person-to-person -person contact and typically causes a fever, chills, and rash. The case in Massachusetts is the first case identified in the U.S. this year. Texas and Maryland each reported a single case last year. Well, pop star Rihanna is now a mom. She and fellow entertainer ASAP Rocky have welcomed a baby boy, according to several reports. TMZ says the 34-year-old singer from Barbados gave birth last Friday. A source close to the couple says that they are at home in Los Angeles with the baby doing very well. Chances are you have heard her latest song, tens of millions of people have. But this sultry singer's rise to fame started by writing hits for other artists. From songwriter now to powerhouse in her own right, in tonight's Prime Playlist, I sit down with Money Long, who is truly having a moment. Viral sensation Money Long may seem like an overnight success, but this breakout solo artist has already made quite a name for herself. After spending 12 years co-writing, chart-topping songs for icons like Ariana Grande, Mariah Carey, Rihanna, and Kelly Clarkson, now it's her time. She released Hours and Hours in January, quickly viewed by tens of millions on TikTok and other social media. It put her exactly where she wants to be, out front, on top, and singing her own songs. I'm sitting here? Yep. On this night, sharing her incredible journey with us that begins and ends with storytelling. I'm a fan of writing about nuance like perspectives, different moments, and describing how that feels. It's pretty easy when you just keep it truthful. Her truth turned into hit after hit, co-writing number one songs like... It's going down. One of my favorite lyrics that I've ever written is from California King Bed. I love that song. Thank you. Lips that felt just like the inside of a rose. I've never kissed a rose, so I don't know, but I assume that it's very soft. Beautiful lyrics, but the writing credit on that song and so many others lists Priscilla Renee, not Money Long. Money Long, this, the name and the character um, that I created was really just the person that I always was and the way that I always saw myself. Born in Vero Beach, Florida, Priscilla started singing at the age of two, wrote her first song when she was eight. More than two decades later, a prolific, gifted songwriter with financial success and yet the constant feeling of wanting more. A lot of times you walk into a room, I could have all these accolades and hits under my belt, but the artist that I'm working for has no clue. Very rarely do um, your co-writers actually know who you are. It breaks my heart a little bit. It's like a speed dating. You got four to, four to eight hours to write a hit song, and you're doing this every day. I could do this for hours. Told time and again she was only a songwriter. While she never believed it, she did begin to question if her dreams were attainable. And then this, an empowering encounter with Jay-Z at a party. And he said to you what? Uh, he just sort of like motioned for me to lift my head up and like, you know, came down to my level and was like, hi, I'm Sean. He's letting me know that uh, I'm not small, you know, don't, don't make myself small. A powerful sentiment that would turn into a mantra and eventually transform Priscilla into money. It took me a long time to realize that I had a choice about who I wanted to be. A confident, take-control artist who starts her viral hit with this. I don't usually do this, but, um, oh my God. Can I sing to you? <laughs> the answer from millions and the industry that pigeonholed her for years, an overwhelming yes. I didn't want people to automatically assume that I'm just a songwriter trying to transition. A huge part of it for me is also representation. You know, when you look at all the little black girls that are singing my songs on TikTok, babies, they can't even barely talk, and they're loving my music. I could not do that as Priscilla. 
loving and covering her music everywhere. This is a favorite. That's a future star right there. Slightly less talented, but still eager to learn. That way you could do like a strum and a ch ch Yep. And then your little boom, boom. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Currently represented by Def Jam Records, ready for her star to rise. Reflecting on that idea, transformation, not just a simple name change, but a new way to look at her future. Come on in here and get this tea while it's hot. And how about this? Money now taking calls from and meetings with some who didn't think Priscilla had what it takes. You wasn't focused, so focused. That means the plan worked. My mom always says, don't tell people where you're going because they'll get in your way. So by the time people found out that it was me, it's too late. You can't stop it. A decade of pitching and selling her songs, chasing her dreams all while waking up every day in physical pain. Quietly battling lupus, an autoimmune disease that can be debilitating, even deadly. I had a few scares where I thought like, what if I don't make it? Um, dealing with respiratory issues, I thought, if I die, would I be happy with what I have done so far? And at the time I asked myself that, the answer was no. So I decided that I would stop doing things I don't wanna do and just only do what I want to do, no matter what anybody thinks. And, even though you're pretty with an attitude. and that brings us to today, a new album of her songs, She Sings Them All, under a record label she built and runs. Pain, her latest single, just released along with a music video she co-directed. <laughs> a little acting going on. That's part of creation. Yeah. A lot of times, I could just be talking about the human relationship. I've been married for eight years, so, you know, of course there are ups and downs in marriage, as I'm sure you know, you love each other, and then you're just like, oh, what, what have I done? Marriage. Um, yeah, and then you're like, oh, I love you, you know, the next day. Songs about love, relationships, life. Priscilla's work will always be there, but money is just getting started. If I truly believe anything is possible, anything or anyone that is contradicting that, you know, I have the right to express myself. I just don't have any limits. Like, there's literally no limitations. I'm always like, why not? Well, there it was, Priscilla Renee. It's Money Long Now. That human being is amazingly talented, and she was really wonderful to be with. We thank her for taking the time out of her really busy schedule as her album is about to drop next month. All right, now let's turn to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Our next guest has made a name for herself with her impressive makeup transformations. As an actress, a model, a makeup artist, Sydney Morgan has grown her audience to more than 8 million followers on TikTok in just two years. 20-year-old makes doing makeup look easy and has racked up nearly 200 million views. But Sydney is so much more than just that. She's authentic and honest, two qualities not easy to come by so much these days. Sydney, thanks so much for taking time and joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's good to have you here. You're known for regularly sharing your story uh, of being diagnosed with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis during your junior year of high school and actually having to undergo surgery to get your colon removed during your senior year. But you've now found a way to use makeup as a transformative tool to help anyone, anyone who has a chronic illness, be more comfortable with their condition, which is pretty spectacular. What inspired you to use makeup to do that? Yeah, so I've always been an artist growing up, drawing and painting, and it's always been a way for me to kind of use it as my creative outlet. And so being able to tie in chronic illness and Crohn's and colitis with that has just been super helpful for me to kind of get my message across. And it's, it's resonated with a lot of my followers as well. You initially kept your content hidden from those around you, but would caption videos day one of doing my makeup until I get noticed. Why do you think your videos began to go viral? I think it, it kind of started to go viral because I was coming from a place of authenticity and just kind of being true to myself and doing it because I love to do it and it was a passion of mine. And I think that that came across in these videos. 
a big hot button issue for a lot of Gen Zers is being more transparent than the previous generation. Your content ranges in topics from honing in on your confidence to mental health uh, and carries a very vulnerable perspective throughout. Do you find that being authentic and honest uh, can be really powerful? And why do you think it's so powerful? So it's, it's very important to me to be authentic to my audience and my fans because I just feel like it it builds that relationship and I want them to know that I am being genuine with them and I, I just treat them as friends at the end of the day. So it's not just that. You're, you're making a name for yourself as an actress and a model as well. You have a handful of projects coming up a little later this year. What are you hoping to develop for the next phase of your career as you move on from this? Yeah, so I'm super excited to be getting more into acting. I actually have a project coming up called Kindling, and it's a horror movie that I'm acting in as well as producing. And we just launched the campaign for that, and partial funds from the campaign are going toward the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation as well as the Trevor Project. You work a lot with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, right? You're actually an ambassador? I am, yeah. So I kind of advocate for how people can get involved or donate or upcoming events for that. And there are some walks coming up called Take Steps that I'm going to be speaking at the LA one as well as the Pittsburgh walk, which is where I'm from. If there was one thing, I mean, you talk about being open and honest uh, with the folks on TikTok, but if there was one thing that you wanted your audience to know about you that they don't already, what would it be? Well, wow, that's a tough question because I do share a lot with them. There's barely anything that they don't know. Um, I guess just to be yourself and do what makes you happy and not care what other people think because that's what I do and that's what got me to where I am today. So I really hope that that message carries across to them. That's good, but what's your favorite food? My favorite food? Um, probably a dessert like cookies or brownies mm. or something. Okay. I wonder if they know that. Favorite color? Purple, because it's the um, awareness color yes, for it is. colitis. It absolutely is. Um, I have a brother uh, who deals with that as well, and he's involved with the foundation too. Uh, lastly, with the, with the platform and brand that you've already created for yourself, obviously, uh, with millions and millions of follow followers, what can we expect next with your advocacy and that brand? Um, yeah, just that film coming out and... Um, just going to continue to share with everyone and hope that I can raise awareness for Crohn's and colitis. Well, you're absolutely doing that, Sydney Morgan. I really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us and everything you do for folks who have not only Crohn's and colitis, but other chronic illnesses. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Tiger Woods plays a shot on the 18th hole, first round of this year's PGA Championship, being played in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Win or lose, good to see him continuing his recovery and back on the course. That's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the warning about scammers potentially trying to take advantage of the baby formula shortage and the unsettling swings on Wall Street. Stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. 
Zelensky is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast. Wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Phil Lipoff, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The Oklahoma legislature today passed a bill that bans abortion at conception. The most restrictive abortion ban in the country would go into effect immediately if signed by the governor. It is modeled after the controversial Texas law that opens up providers and anyone who, quote, aids and abets an abortion to civil lawsuits. Abortion rights advocates say they plan to challenge the law. In Ukraine, Russia says more than 1,700 soldiers who made their stand inside the Mariupol steel plant have surrendered. The Red Cross scrambling to register the prisoners of war amid international fears the Kremlin could hurt or even kill the prisoners. An unknown number of fighters remain inside that bombed out plant. And after an erratic day, the stock market closed with mixed results as investors continue to grapple to understand what's next with inflation and interest rates. The benchmark S&P 500 fell slightly as it approaches bear market territory. The Dow Jones Industrial Average also ended slightly lower after yesterday's major losses. Only the Nasdaq finished the day with a slight gain. Now to the Buffalo supermarket suspected shooter's first court appearance. One of the family members of the victims actually calling the suspect a coward on his way into court. Stephanie Ramos reports. Tonight, the 18-year-old accused of shooting 13 people in a racially motivated attack at that Buffalo supermarket appearing in court under tight security. For the first time, Peyton Gendron facing some of the families of the 10 killed and three injured five days ago. Do you understand what today's proceeding is about? Yes. And as he was led out of the courtroom, a victim's relative yelling out. Peyton, you're a coward. The suspect, who pleaded not guilty to an initial charge of first-degree murder, now indicted by a grand jury. With 11 out of the 13 shooting victims black, authorities are investigating Saturday's rampage at the Topps store as a hate crime and racially motivated violent extremism. How dare you! Victims' relatives sharing their anguish today, among them the mother of Hayward Patterson's son, Jake. His heart is broken. He has sleep. He has eat. And as a mother, what am I supposed to do? Investigators are combing through the suspect's social media posts, where authorities say he documented his months-long plot to kill as many black people as possible. The suspect able to collect weapons even after he was investigated by state police nearly a year ago for disturbing comments about murder-suicide around his high school graduation. Neither the school or police filing a petition in a court, which could have triggered a red flag for any gun purchases in the future. Tonight, the FBI concluding its investigation at the supermarket, releasing it to Tops as the company vowed to reopen. And it will be an honor to, uh, to the victims and all the survivors of this uh, tragic event. Employee Jerome Bridges says he'll return, telling our affiliate WKBW he led colleagues to safety in a back room when the gunfire erupted. Since that day, he has not taken off his top's name tag. It helps remind me that anything is possible, anything can happen at any time, any place, any day of the week. Scary sentiment. Stephanie Ramos from Buffalo tonight. Next to the pandemic, a CDC panel is officially recommending Pfizer booster shots for children 5 to 11. It comes as studies show that two doses of the vaccine provides little protection from the contagious Omicron B2 variant, but a booster shot should be enough protection. Daily COVID-19 cases have quadrupled since March, 100,000 new cases per day. Here's Whit Johnson. 
Tonight, a CDC panel signing off on booster shots for kids 5 to 11 years old, five months after their initial shots. 11 yeses, one no, one abstention, and so the motion passes. The CDC pointing to the vaccine's waning protection against symptomatic infections across all age groups, from 60% after two doses to 20% a few months later. But protection remains strong against severe disease. New Pfizer data showed the booster shot increased antibodies 22-fold against Omicron in 5 to 11-year-olds who had no evidence of prior COVID infection. When we look at the efficacy of vaccine, it's not only just about getting the virus, but it's also about protecting our children from becoming hospitalized, long COVID, the various other things that can happen when we get a virus like this. Pharmacies now gearing up to roll out more boosters, some parents eager to get in line. I know a lot of people that are getting sick, so I mean, whatever helps. Others still on the fence. Like this came out with too, st too much stuff too fast for me. But the panel today voicing concern that more than 70% of kids in that age group haven't even gotten their first two doses. Boosters are great once we've got everyone their first round, and I think that needs to be a priority. This as the country is now averaging nearly 100,000 new COVID cases every day, infections quadrupling in the last six weeks, about 25,000 patients in the hospital, the highest number since mid-March. I will say this particular virus continues to throw us curveballs, and I think it really continues to find people who have not been infected. Our thanks to Whit Johnson tonight. Next to the FDA commissioner on the hot seat on Capitol Hill today over the baby formula crisis, uh, facing tough questions about why it took his agency so long to intervene. He did say that Abbott factory, which has been closed since February, could be up and running again by as early as next week. Parents tonight, though, still worried it will take much longer to restock the shelves. Maria Villarreal reports. Tonight in Washington, lawmakers grilling the head of the FDA, demanding to know how the baby formula crisis was allowed to happen. You can't hide behind an investigation. We need answers. We need them now. You know, uh, as I've said, we could do better than we did. Dr. Robert Califf promising the situation will get gradually better with the reopening of Abbott's main formula manufacturing plant in Michigan. We've already made significant progress. And I think we are on track to get open within uh, the next uh, week to two weeks, most likely uh, at the outer bound two weeks. President Biden invoking the Defense Production Act to rush formula ingredients to manufacturers and import formula from overseas. But even with that, the FDA commissioner acknowledging it'll be a few weeks until things get back to normal. Are you sleeping, baby? Cold comfort for parents like Amanda Mendoza, who is struggling to feed her seven-month-old daughter. I went to over 20 stores in one day. Aisle upon aisle of empty shelves. And it's like this everywhere we go. The search stressful and demoralizing. Sometimes I want to cry when I don't find it because I don't know if she's going to eat. In that same town, another mom, Jacqueline Medrano, joining a Facebook group trying to help. It's called the Nationwide Formula Search, with nearly 800 members in less than two weeks. Essentially, you could have a mom who hasn't been able to find formula in their area, but maybe someone in another state has what they're needing. You can really hear how desperate these women are becoming, um, trying to figure out what their next move is going to be. How does it make you feel? Um, it makes me feel like I can't do enough. Maria Villarreal from Dallas-Fort Worth tonight. The Oklahoma State Legislature has passed the most restrictive abortion ban in America. And now it's onto the governor's desk and he is expected to sign it. The bill bans almost all abortions from the moment of conception. And it relies on lawsuits from private citizens to enforce it, similar to that law passed in Texas earlier this year. ABC's Rachel Scott here with what happens next. Tonight in Oklahoma, a bill banning almost all abortions from the moment of conception heading to the governor who has vowed to sign it. We want to outlaw abortion in the state of Oklahoma. The bill includes narrow exceptions to protect the life of the mother and for cases of rape and incest, but only if they're reported to law enforcement. I sat down with the bill's author, State Representative Wendy Stearman. Critics say, why not make exceptions to cover 
all of those instances, especially when rape and incest are so underreported? Well, the goal of this is to protect the child, the, the unborn child. So I, I believe that putting in the exception as we have it is, um, is acceptable in this situation. But today, Vice President Kamala Harris calling it outrageous. It's just the latest in a series of extreme laws around the country. The Oklahoma bill takes a page out of the Texas playbook, empowering private citizens to sue anyone who aids or abets an abortion. The reward, at least $10,000. And when it is signed, it will take effect immediately. Rachel Scott from the nation's capital tonight. As President Biden heads to Asia for meetings with our allies in South Korea and Japan, tensions remain high as North Korea threatens nuclear missile tests and Vladimir Putin suggests using nuclear weapons in the war in Ukraine. So tonight, we have an ABC News exclusive with rare access to a U.S. Navy nuclear ballistic missile submarine, part of our efforts to deter potential nuclear threats. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz recently got a, a rare glimpse of life on board that sub and a look at what the U.S. military does on the seas to keep us all safe. It is a breathtaking sight that few will ever see. A nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine 550 feet long surfacing briefly in the Pacific Ocean. With 20 strategic nuclear missiles on board, this submarine is America's most heavily armed warship. I'd say it's the most powerful force in the world right now. Vice Admiral Bill Houston is the commander of U.S. submarine forces, including this ship, the USS Maine. As we approach the massive submarine, he stresses that the mission of the 150 sailors on board is deterrence. We are trying to prevent war with this ship right now, and we're trying to protect U.S. allied and partner interests with this. With the crisis in Ukraine, the ratcheting up of rhetoric from Russia and China, that goal is now being put to the test. When you hear Vladimir Putin and Lavrov and others talk about the possibility of using nuclear weapons, what does that do when you're on a submarine like this? It's uh, very dangerous. It's really irresponsible. And from a naval officer's standpoint, it's very unprofessional. It gives more meaning to this mission. But we view our mission as a peace mission. It's purely defensive. From the unnerving yet necessary launch simulations to remaining constantly vigilant while on board, it is a mission this tight-knit crew does not take lightly. What are we, day 48, 49, something like that? Something like that, yeah. You lose count, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I really like it, though. Women have only been allowed to serve on submarines since 2010. 22-year-old EMN3 Carla Galindo Gonzalez from Colorado is one of them. Explain why you really like being under sea for that long. So it really takes you away from everything outside. It's easier to keep everything else that's really distracting you from moving forward. ETVC Chief Wendy Shewitt from Nebraska joined the Navy to serve her country and see the world. After spending years working on airplanes, now at sea. Amazingly, there are people who still don't know that women are on submarines. Right. Is that so. challenging? <laughs> it is, but we're simple. I think they try to uh, walk on eggshells around and they just don't know how to react to us. But they're here to work their butt off and couldn't be prouder of the females we have on board right now. It's pretty much a community on it this is. boat, too. It's a isn't bunch it? of brothers. Yes. <laughs> brothers and sisters yes, now. Finally. The patrols are constant. Those 20 nuclear missiles capable of striking a target from 4,000 miles away. Weapons gone, standing by for fire order. Training exercises are a regular part of everyday life on this ship, including simulating a launch. And now we're headed for the missile control center. That's where the missiles would actually be launched from. It is just down from the control center. There, we saw two junior officers arrive and open a safe, which would contain the key to unfathomable firepower for a simulated exercise. <laughs> Lieutenant Junior Grade Aaron Chandler was a French and economics major at Tulane University. Direct a simulated launch of six missiles. Four. She is now the assistant operations officer on the submarine. Lock the key in the safe. Lock, Lock the key in the, in the safe, safe, I, sir. When you hold that key, even though you're simulating it, 
Do you think how serious a job that is and what could happen? It is pretty crazy, but the gravity of the situation is not ever lost. It is really sobering to think about the implications of what that key actually does. Um, but, I mean, that's why, that's why we're here. That's why we train. But even what passes for a normal day on this submarine is far from it. This is the birthing area where all of the sailors sleep nine to a bunk crew. But in between, these are the tubes where the ballistic missiles are stored. That very small shared sleeping space affords almost zero privacy. But privacy is hard to find on this submarine. Enlisted sailors eat their meals in this cruise mess. And in the galley, CSS3 James Curtis shows us how to pack breakfast, lunch, and dinner for months at sea. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of food. And how do you keep all that food fresh? The oldest products get used first, and um, so we could maintain the freshness of the food. Um, if we get fresh, uh, we usually burn through that uh, pretty fast. There are no phones, no televisions, only occasional use of email. We're catching up on you know, several months' worth of information that we missed, uh, going home talking to our families. We don't, they know everything that's happened while we're gone. The ship's captain, Commander Darren Gerhardt, says while life on board can be difficult, there are silver linings that keep morale high. Today, a game of cards, cribbage. It's tradition. But almost everyone on this submarine volunteered for this kind of work. And with tensions across the world so high, Admiral Houston tells us this submarine's mission is as crucial as ever. Do you feel like we're in another Cold War? I would say it's a Cold War, but it's a Cold War that we haven't really experienced. In the Cold War, it was the United States and the Soviet Union, and now it's China, Russia, and the United States, with China and Russia being near-peer adversaries. And how does that change your job? Makes it um, more challenging, but I can tell you the Navy and the submarine force and this crew is ready for that challenge every single day, 365, 24-7. A challenge that will continue unabated. Rare access to that sub tonight from Martha Raddatz. Still to come, after the uproar over this moment at her funeral, Israel makes a decision on whether or not it will investigate the death of a prominent Al Jazeera journalist who many believe was killed by a bullet from an Israeli gun. And we speak with comedian, activist, and queer icon, Sam Jay. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. 
Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. The Israeli military will not investigate the shooting of Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. Local media reports the government believes an inquiry would lead to controversy inside Israel. Abu Akleh's family says they are not surprised and they are calling on the U.S. and the international community to conduct an open and transparent investigation. Abu Akleh was a U.S. citizen. She was shot while covering an Israeli military raid in the West Bank last week. Leaders from Finland and Sweden met with President Biden and members of Congress to discuss their bids for NATO membership today. In his comments with the president, the Finnish president said his country is open to discussing any concerns Turkey might have in regards to their application. President Biden, congressional Democrats and Republicans all voiced their full support for membership. And let's call it a happy waddle to see in Argentina, 18 penguins, including a rare rock hopper, released into the wild after being nursed back to health. The penguins were rescued when biologists found them stranded, malnourished, some even sick. All right, we are joined now by comedian, entertainer, and queer icon who is bringing back candid conversations about sexuality, gender, and other cultural issues that both divide and connect us in season two of her HBO series, Pause, with Sam J. Take a listen. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Samaria Johnson. I didn't really come out. Like, when I hear young people talking about, I gathered everybody in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I have something to say. That's yeah, different now. Sam J joins us in studio here. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, out of your schedule to be here with us tonight. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of questions I want to ask you. First, season two. <laughs> yes. How is season two different than season one? Uh, it's just more personal, you know what I mean? I think season one, I was kind of looking out at the world and going like, what's going on here? And in this season, I'm kind of looking inward and going like, what's going on here? So there's a lot more personal episodes and things that I'm just more closely connected to. Yeah, I was just telling you before we, we came on that I think that's the kind of the genius of what you do. You mix humor with all of that, which is, I would imagine, tough at times to mix humor in some of the conversations that you're having. I don't know. I, I just find the darkest things funny, usually. <laughs> so it's not too tough, you know what I mean? It probably should be harder. That's probably something I should talk to my therapist about. <laughs> but um, nah, I just find funniness in the in the dark stuff. Well, it, come, it seems to come easy to you. I, I want to... I want to get this straight, no pun intended. Pause is a, a slang term uh, when something can be interpreted as gay. I, I would imagine some in the queer community could interpret pause as something offensive. Yes. Uh, so tell me why you put it in the name of the show and what it means to you. <laughs> uh, well, honestly, when we thought about what the show is asking, we were saying, like, it is kind of telling people, like, to take a pause you know, consider another perspective you may not have heard, consider another experience you may not have had. So that was part of it was just like, we feel like that's what the show kind of makes you do when you watch it is kind of take a pause and go, huh, I haven't really thought about it like that. Or at least that's the hope is that we're doing that. And the other thing is that I'm a comic and I just find uh, being a jerk funny. <laughs> and <laughs> because I know it's used sometimes in the straight community as a homophobic thing, I was like, it would be funny to be a gay woman with a show called Pause. And so you are. <laughs> um, you talk about the complicated experience of blending um, queerness and blackness uh, in the first episode. And you go on to say, uh, I was black before I was gay. Um, how important is this to your journey? Um, I mean, I think it's very important, especially when you are a multitude of things. I'm, I'm a lesbian, so you know, I'm queer, I'm a woman, I'm black. And so these are all things that potentially can work against me and do work against me in society. And so it's like, well, then what thing do you have to assign yourself to? And I think sometimes people feel like, oh, well, you should prioritize your gayness because of what's happening right now. But it's like, that's not how my brain actually works because since I was young and could comprehend, I understood that this was gonna be a reason why someone treated me differently or this was gonna be a reason why I didn't get something that someone who didn't have this got. And so that's the first and forefront of my mind because it's the longest experience I've had with, you know, discrimination. And you talk about the show not being for everybody. Um, you're okay with that. Do you try to make the show for everybody or you just make the show and who takes to it, takes to it? I mean, it's a little bit of both. 
I think, you know, like I make the show that I want to make, you know, and that I believe in and that I can stand on. And if you're into that, awesome. If you're not, that's also okay. But I also think by tackling the topics the way we do and the nuance that we take, it does leave room for everybody to get something out of it. You don't have to be gay to get something out of it. You don't have to be black to get something out of it. You don't have to be a woman to get something out of it. I think it does leave that space as well. I have none of those three things, and I love your show. Oh, thank so you. So I think, I, think, I think it actually is for everybody, anybody who wants to laugh and, and think about these issues, talk about these issues. A, a lot of the things that you get into could be uncomfortable for some people, if they're not for your friends and they're not for you, but maybe someone watching the show. But then you I inject your humor into it. Obviously, you were, you're funny, and you're into issues like this. When did you blend the two? When did you think, yeah, let me just do this? <laughs> I mean, I think it always was kind of a blending. I feel like that's what stand-up is. I think stand-up as an art form blends the two. You know what I mean? At least the stand-up that I love, you know, the Richard Pryor, the Dave Chappelle, the Chris Rocks, um, Wanda Sykes, and, and on and on. So for me, the show is just like this growth of stand-up and this other iteration where I can take ideas that in stand-up I kind of got to hit really quick and I can blow them out, you know? Do you see possibly a season three? I mean... Are you in for it? I'm in for it eventually. I think I need some space to think, you know what I mean? It's just like stand-up. You gotta go out and get some life experience to bring it back to something to make it great. And so I wouldn't want to just run into it without the proper time. Yeah. All right, well, I, I'll just say thanks for the, the show <laughs> because it's not only entertaining, but it's thought-provoking, which I, I think is what, exactly what you wanted it to be. That's really cool to hear, because it is, so thank you. Yeah, I know, congratulations on it. Uh, season two of Pause with Sam J drops on HBO tomorrow. Sam J, thank you so much for the show and for being here today. Thank you, this was cool. It was cool. It's still to come, a graduation celebration that one veteran says only happened because of the canine companion by her side. Their story is our local lowdown, and it's next. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Graduation Day is a special moment for millions of people all across the country every year, but for one military sexual trauma survivor, uh, walking the stage was something she wasn't sure she'd ever do. Reporter Wendy Lane from Action News in Tampa Bay introduces us to the service dog credited for making that special moment possible in tonight's local loadout. You can't see in the video, but I was crying. Stephanie Marvin Miller says her service dog, Leland, is the reason she graduated from college. It was hard, and I didn't even think I could go to college. I didn't think I could be a good wife. Stephanie is an Army veteran and a military sexual trauma survivor. January of 2016, I was sexually assaulted by another service member. She says her PTSD was so paralyzing that she couldn't even leave her home. You know, I would have night terrors that were so awful and they bled into the daytime. Before Leland entered Stephanie's life in 2020, for years, the Murfreesboro, Tennessee resident tried to get a service dog, but was rejected. I mean, there are so many service dog organizations out there 
and I was rejected from 11 different organizations because the nature of my PTSD stems from military sexual trauma and not from combat. Until Southeastern Guide Dogs in Manatee County heard Stephanie's story and paired her with Leland, a yellow lab who Stephanie says has changed her life. He's done so much. I can go grocery shopping. I was able to go back to college. He helps with flashbacks. He's even helped me focus in class. And helped her get a bachelor's degree at Middle Tennessee State University. And I was so proud of Leland. On Saturday, both in cap and gowns and both of their names called during graduation. My tears started flowing then and they didn't stop until I was back in my seat. Stephanie wearing a cap that said, I hope my dog is proud of me. His tail was high and wagging the whole time. And Leland's cap said, I am. What a special story. Uh, we thank Wendy Lane for bringing that to us. And of course, Stephanie and Leland as well. That's our show for tonight. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news.